Hi everyone, and welcome back to Railway. Today's episode is the last in a short block of time lapses showing you how to customize my blank station asset in three different environments. The focus of this video will be a small rural village in the UK with a railway cutting beside it. By its nature, this will be quite a basic build and therefore a short video. So let's get into it. So as always, I'm starting here with the placement of the station into a deep cutting that runs beside a village. As we're going for more rural feel here, we've got some wooden tracks rather than the concrete tracks that I've used in the past. The next task is to wire up some transport lines so that I can use some live vehicles to plot out the station I'm going to build. What I wanted to create with this station is something that is used by very, very small trains and only a few times a day. Doing the work on this station are these Adelaide 3000 series diesel multiple units created by Meshed. Once I can see where the two and three car vehicles will stop, I can use the ruler prop to mark the position and scale everything around that accordingly. Luckily, you can see the stopping points lined up perfectly on both sides. Sometimes vehicles in a game will stop at different points on different sides of the station, so it's always good to double check and ensure that they're exactly where you want them to be. I'm using the same technique as in past videos to use the stopped vehicle to line up the platforms to make sure that they're flush with the edge of the door. This station is not going to be particularly flashy, which honestly reflects the nature of the environment around it. The village beside it may have been important in the past, or this station could have been at the junction of two lines which necessitated the stop, but now it's pretty run down and only sees a handful of passengers per day. It will be pretty bereft of bells and whistles. To connect the station to the village, I'm creating an overbridge and access pathway between the village green and the opposite side of the cutting. I'm using the same trick of anchoring the pedestrian path to the ground rather than snapping it onto the road. This is one of the benefits of pedestrian pathways. You can be a bit more flexible as the game will be a bit more forgiving. If two pathways are within eight meters or one zoning square, Sims will happily plot a path between them. Because this station is in quite a deep cutting below the surface of the surrounding terrain, what I've had to do is to come all the way around the other side and slowly wind the track down the hill to the lower elevation. Taking this approach means that you don't have a situation where a passenger would have to climb 8 or 10 flights of stairs to get down from that overpass that I built earlier. Not to mention, a massive looping ramp or stairwell structure wouldn't be in keeping with the environment we're trying to build here. If you also consider what I keep saying about the importance of access, you don't want too steep a pathway or too many stairs because if it is a massive effort to get up from or down to the station, people in the real world would tend not to use it. Having now brought the pathway down to a reasonable height, we need to build the platform access. As it's a basic station, all I'm adding here are simple ramps, and to create a landing of sorts I've added an extra node to the segment and used node control to flatten it. These little details are what can really make or break the realism of a station. It's about looking carefully at things that you see in the real world and taking note of what you might otherwise miss. Landings like you'd have on stairs exist almost as often on ramps as well. It's quite unlikely to see something that is completely inclined the entire way down.
To tidy up the edges of the platforms, I'm adding some wrought iron fencing that I've weathered slightly by using prop painter or procedural objects to recolor. This is so they look a little bit older and perhaps haven't been cared for as well, given they're out in the elements and would have been stained by the rain over time. Here's a nice trick that I like to do on any of these older or more rural platforms. I create a sloping platform end by grabbing those same platform network extensions so that you don't have any of the yellow lines or tactile pavements, and simply align one end to the height of the platforms and the other to the height of the ground. Having made the decision to use diesel trains, I'm replacing all of the track containing containery supports with unwired track. You'll also see me replot the station using the Railway Replacer mod, because even though there are ways to edit the tracks of already plop stations, I find it quicker and easier to replace it and reconnect the lines. Just make sure you align it using the fine movement control in Move It, so the stopping positions we worked out earlier will remain in the same place. Here in the UK, you get these odd things at the end of platforms called anti-trespass panels, which are kind of like a square of rubberized spikes to provide a visual and physical barrier, deterring people from roaming off the end of the platform. I might go about creating some of these as props, but for now, I'm using these oversized tactile pavers to perform the same task. Another benefit of PO here is being able to control which network I'd like the decal to apply to. Typically, when you use a decal, any network or surface that it lands on will be affected. But once you change it into a PO, you can move it up or down so it only affects which part you'd like. Finally, it's onto the key details of the platform, lighting, shelters, signage, etc. I'm using older gas style lamps for platform lighting, as when you consider the age of this station and that it won't have been particularly modernized over time, you're unlikely to see anything more modern than these. The same goes for station signage. An older style sign with an older style typeface will really cement the fact that this is a relic of an older period of time and a bit of a time capsule. I've chosen Haberfield as a name. Really, this is just a portmanteau of commonplace names in the UK. Nothing special or meaningful, I'm afraid. For the ticket machine, I'm using a car park barrier to stand in for something known in the UK as a Pertus machine. These are very early versions of modern ticket vending machines. They will accept any amount of cash, even as little as 5 pence, and spit out a permit to travel that lasts for 2 hours. It's intended to allow people who haven't pre-bought tickets to travel from unstaffed stations like this one. And you're supposed to exchange it at your destination for a proper ticket and pay any difference in fare. They're increasingly rare, but it is a fun bit of trivia to include.
And last but not least, I'm adding some bushes and trees into this little gully area between the platforms and the cutting. Because I tend to use maps that require the unlimited trees mod, that means that I can't use tree snapping. To get around this, I'm using the tree and vehicle props mod, which creates prop copies of all of your trees, so that you can elevate them using prop snapping, or change them to POs to adjust their size, shape and colour. This is the last in this little block of time-lapse videos that I was planning to do. First we started with the urban setting, we've done the industrial setting, and now we've finished the rural setting too. The plan from here is to go through some of the techniques that I've demonstrated in these videos in a bit more detail, because I know that they do go past very very quickly on these time lapses, and I will go into a bit more detail on each of them, like the very first video that I did, where I focused on single and double track connections. So that's it for now, thanks very much, and I'll see you next time.